Good morning, brothers and sisters and friends. Welcome to NCAC Online Service. Let us start our worship by reading this Bible verse. It is on Psalm 59, verse 16. But as for me, I will sing about your power. Each morning, I will sing with joy about your unfailing love. For you have been my refuge, a place of safety when I am in distress. Let us bow down and pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you that uh, you are our refuge. It is a safe place for us to come to talk to you, to pray to you. And now we are here to worship you. May you receive our worship and accept our heart of worship. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Good morning, NCAC. We hope that you're all keeping well. We want to welcome each and every one of you to the third Sunday of our mission month at our church. Let us come together and worship the Lord with one heart. You have, you have called us out of darkness into your glorious light that we may sing the wonders of the risen Christ. Be our every breath to us strive with boundless love and deepest joy with endless life may the peoples praise you let the nations be glad all your blessing comes that we may praise may praise the name of Jesus Harvest is your own, and from your hand we give to you to make Christ known. May the seeds of mercy grow in us for those who have not heard. May souls of praise build lives of grace to spread your
Joy. 
praise, sing the name of Jesus. Dr. Reverend Curtis Peter is going to preach Acts chapter 1, 1 to 14. Let me read this scripture. In my former book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and to teach until the day he was taken up to heaven. After giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen, after his suffering, he presented himself to them and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command, Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speaking about. For John baptized with water, but in few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Then they gathered around him and asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, It is not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. You will be my witness in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. After he said this, he was taken up before the very eyes and a cloud hid him from their sight. They were looking intently up into the sky as he was going, when suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them. Men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand here looking into the sky? This same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way you have seen him go, go to, into heaven. Then the apostles returned to Jerusalem from the hill called the Mount Olives, a Sabbath walk, a day's walk from the city. When they arrived, they went upstairs to the room where they were staying. Those pre present were Peter, John, James and Andrew, Philip, Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James, son of Alphaeus, and Simon the Salad, and Judas, son of James. They all joined together constantly in prayer, along with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brother. Today, we are very happy to have Reverend Curtis Peter, our district superintendent, to deliver a message to us. He's married to Trizia, his wife, and have three children, Lucas, Micah, and Liam. They spent 11 years in Caribbean sun regions as an international workers. Please welcome Reverend Curtis Peter. Well, dear brothers and sisters, what a joy to be with you as part of your joint missions conference as a Canadian Chinese Alliance Church Association. I want to thank you for setting aside this month to focus on our Alliance DNA as an Acts 1-8 movement. In my short time as a district superintendent, I have witnessed how you as a Chinese Alliance Association have truly embraced our DNA as mission-focused people. I have seen you make tremendous sacrifices to, to take the extraordinary news of Jesus to those immediately around us in our Jerusalem, as well as those a little farther off in Judea or those nearby from other cultures like Samaria, and ultimately to the least reached peoples in the farthest corners of the earth. You are an inspiration to our entire Alliance family, and I'm so excited to be part of this joint missions conference that you have put together to continue stoking the fire of mission-focused passion. Now, what's immediately obvious to me as I look at your theme verse from Acts 1 verse 8 is that the catalyst who will make possible the fulfillment of this commission to be witnesses for Jesus to the ends of the earth is the person of the Holy Spirit. Just weeks before Jesus had spoken these words, uh, despite their best intentions and promises to do otherwise, the disciples had scattered in fear when Jesus was arrested and taken to the cross. 
Evidently, they needed more than sheer willpower to fulfill this mandate. So after he was risen from the dead, Jesus was crystal clear that before they could be his witnesses, they needed to receive his power through the Holy Spirit. In fact, a few verses earlier in Acts chapter 1 verse 4, Jesus explicitly commanded them, Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my Father promised, which you have heard me speak about. They simply could not accelerate into mission without first being anointed with power from on high. Our president spoke about this a couple of weeks ago when he declared that what we need is not more human activity, but more spirit-empowered action. And so I want to invite us to consider this morning what it means for us to wait for the gift of the Holy Spirit in a continual posture of prayer and worship. Our mission to the ends of the earth is birthed, sustained, and accelerated as we saturate ourselves in his presence. We need to wait on him in prayer before we go on mission, while we are on mission, and as we seek to accelerate our mission. And we need to do so with the spirit of worship, immersing ourselves in the goodness and beauty of the one we are proclaiming to the nations. This is what I want to explore with you today how prayer and worship are catalysts for spirit-empowered mission that results in multiplying disciples everywhere. Well, notice that the first thing the disciples did after Jesus gave them this commission in Acts chapter 1 verse 8 was to return to Jerusalem, go upstairs to the room where they were staying, and begin to pray. In Acts 1 verse 14, it says, They all joined together constantly in prayer along with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers, a group numbering 120. Well, this evidently continued over the next 10 days between the ascension of Jesus and the day of Pentecost, because in Acts 2 verse 1, it says, when the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. They took the words of Jesus seriously. Wait for the gift my father promised. Don't go on mission without first receiving power through the Holy Spirit. It just won't work. And so they waited, joining together constantly in prayer until he came. And that changed everything, didn't it? Acts chapter 2 records how they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages that enabled them to declare the wonders of God to all the foreigners visiting Jerusalem. I love that phrase from Acts chapter 2, verse 11. It says, all the people exclaimed, we hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues. Friends, may the same be true of every sermon you or I preach, or every word of Christ that we share with an unbelieving friend or in our churches, that people would be drawn up into worship as we declare the wonders of God. We aren't just preaching a dry message. No, we are declaring God's wonders. This is the kind of preaching and sharing that I believe is cultivated in our private life of worship. When we saturate ourselves in joy-filled awe and worship at the glory and beauty of Christ, who reveals to us the majesty of the Father, our words will naturally declare the wonders that we have experienced from our immersion in His presence. This is mission birthed out of worship, not because we have to, but because we want to. We are so enthralled with the beauty of the king that we can't help but do otherwise. Like the disciples said in Acts chapter 4 verse 20, we cannot help speaking about what we have seen and heard. It's mission birthed out of worship and encounter with Christ. And it's mission that is sustained because it's empowered by the Spirit through prayer. It's one thing to want to tell people about the beauty of Jesus and our encounters with him. It's quite another to keep doing so when we are met with rejection and threats to our lives. In fact, Peter and the disciples had been convinced that they would be willing to die with Jesus. I mean, they loved him. They wanted everyone to know him. But when the soldiers showed up in the Garden of Gethsemane to take Jesus away, Their courage melted, and they were seized with fear. They loved Jesus, and they wanted others to love him, but they lacked power to stand firm in the face of trial. What a difference after the day of Pentecost, when they were all filled with the Spirit. 
What a difference after they gathered together constantly in prayer and received the gift of God's very own presence within them. It changed everything, except, of course, the opposition. That remained the same, possibly even increased. But their ability to multiply disciples everywhere was radically different. You see, prayer and worship are powerful catalysts for mission. They're the accelerants that will enable us to be, truly become Christ-centered, spirit-empowered, mission-focused people, multiplying disciples everywhere. This is, as you know, is our Alliance Vision Prayer, the longing of our hearts as a family of churches. And I truly believe that worship and prayer are the keys to the fulfillment of this longing. It's when with all of our hearts we long for Him, and we express that longing in prayer and worship, in saturating ourselves in His presence, that's when we can become transformed into the Christ-centered, Spirit-empowered, mission-focused people who will indeed be effective in multiplying disciples everywhere. I'd like to unpack those three areas for us a little bit and talk about what it means uh, for prayer and worship to be the foundation. Let's start by talking about what it means to be Christ-centered. Uh, why is prayer and worship so central to us being a Christ-centered people? I think sometimes we can fall into the trap of thinking that being Christ-centered is primarily about theology. In other words, if Christ is the center of our theology, then we must be a Christ-centered people, right? Now, certainly that is a critical component, but I actually think that it goes much deeper than that. We need Christ to be the very center of our lives. This was Paul's prayer in Ephesians chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. He said, I pray that out of his glorious riches, the Father may strengthen you with power through his Spirit in your inner being. Why? So that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. You see, being Christ-centered is actually having Christ at the center of our hearts through the presence of the Spirit. And I'd like to suggest that the way we cultivate space at the very center of our being for Christ to dwell is by abiding in Him through prayer and worship. Now, this will ultimately lead to Spirit-empowered mission that bears much fruit in multiplying disciples. Uh, we learned that in John chapter 15, verse 5, when Jesus said, Those who abide in me and I in them bear much fruit. Uh, so we never want to lose sight of the fact that being Christ-centered leads to bearing fruit on mission. But before we get too far down the track of mission and bearing fruit, I think we need to slow down and focus on the abiding in Jesus part. The, the part about being truly Christ-centered by abiding with Him in intimate prayer and worship. I find it fascinating in John 15 verse 11, just a few verses later, where Jesus goes on to say, I have said these things to you so that, your, so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. Friends, this to me is what abiding in Jesus is all about. It's actually enjoying Him. It's delighting in His words to us, letting them dwell in us richly, as Paul says in Colossians 3.16. It's also saturating ourselves in His love, so much so that we cannot help but love one another. This is actually the central point of this passage. Jesus is calling us to abide in His love and then to obey His command to love one another. I think the problem is when we try to jump straight to the command of loving one another, seeking to bear fruit on mission, without first saturating ourselves in God's love for us, abiding in that love, and letting it be the absolute center of our lives. That's why prayer and worship are so important, because they help us abide in God's love, out of which our love for others will naturally flow. Now, a word about prayer and worship. Uh, to me, the two are intimately linked. Often in my own personal quiet time, I'll just put on some worship music in the morning and, and let the Spirit lead me alternately between rejoicing in God's goodness, maybe then interceding for the world, and also listening for His gentle whispers to me. 
often by leading me to passages of scripture, which will prompt more prayers, more rejoicing, and so on. So when I talk about prayer and worship together, I'm talking about intimacy with Jesus, Christ being the center of my thoughts and affections, and then following his lead as he makes known to me the master's business. Some of my favorite words in scripture come a few verses later in John 15, verse 15, when Jesus says, I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends for everything that I learned from my father, I have made known to you. To me, being Christ-centered is about being friends with Jesus. And Jesus defines this friendship as one in which he shares with us everything he has learned from his father. Talk about intimacy. Jesus invites us into the intimate conversations he has with his own father. He actually calls him our father. And, and, and he makes these incredible mysteries of the father known to us as his kids. Sometimes that may come through prophetic revelation or specific direction for what to do about a particular situation. And often it's simply by bringing to mind the words of scripture that he's already given us. And he makes them come alive in fresh ways for us today. So let me exhort you, dear brothers and sisters, let us be a Christ-centered people, people who abide with Christ in extraordinary intimacy through prayer and worship, listening to him for the words of the Father, reveling in his immeasurable love, and then letting everything else we do flow from the love he pours into our hearts through our times with him. This is what we see in the early disciples, particularly in Acts chapter 4. As they were beginning their spirit-empowered mission, they were dragged in before the religious leaders to explain what they were doing. On verse 8, it says that Peter was filled with the Holy Spirit in order to answer them. And then in verse 13, it says that the religious leaders were astonished by their courage. And they took note that these men had been with Jesus. Oh, friends, if there's one thing I want to be true of me, it's that others would take note that I have been with Jesus, that my life is centered on Christ, that I enjoy him, I hear him, and I obey whatever he asks me to do. That's what was said of Peter and John. And I pray that it would be true of every member of the Canadian Chinese Alliance Church Association, and indeed everyone in the Christian and Missionary Alliance. The result of this for Peter and John was that they were threatened and ordered to stop preaching about Jesus. The same could be true for many of our international workers in the alliance around the world. And there have probably been many times when, when some of us have felt threatened to stay silent as well. Maybe not overtly, but subtle pressures that we feel like we better not go too far or be too extreme for Jesus. This is another reason why prayer and worship, intimacy with Christ is, is so critical to our ongoing spirit-empowered mission. Notice in Acts chapter 4, verses 23 to 31, what Peter and John did after receiving these threats. Remember, too, that at this point, they have already received the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost. They have already been boldly moving forward on spirit-empowered mission. And they've been operating in the supernatural power of God to preach with authority and to heal the sick. In fact, this persecution came because they had just healed a paralyzed man. Incredible works of God at work among them. And yet... Peter and John knew that ongoing prayer and worship were critical to their continuing effectiveness and perseverance. So it says in verses 23 to 29, that upon their release, they went back to their own people, reported these things, and then they all raised their voices in prayer and worship together. First of all, they declared the greatness of God as the one who made the heavens and the earth and the sea and everything in them. They focused on God's greatness and worshiped him for that. And then they focused on the fact that what was happening, even though it was hard, was a fulfillment of the scriptures and something that God had already determined beforehand should happen. And so they reoriented and realigned themselves with God's perspective. 
And then they boldly asked God that he would consider their threats and enable them to speak his word with great boldness. Stretch out your hand, they said, to heal and perform miraculous signs and wonders through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. Oh, friends, when was the last time you prayed like this? When was the last time you were so saturated with the presence of Christ, so fully abiding in him, that you absolutely expected him to break through in supernatural ways to empower you for mission? Oh, may today be one of those days. And may there be many more to come. Well, in verse 31, it concludes by saying, after they prayed, the place where they were meeting was shaken and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God boldly. Again, let me point out, this is Acts chapter four. Acts two has already happened. They've already been filled with the Holy Spirit. But that was then and this is now. Now they were facing new challenges, new threats, new needs. And so they needed a new filling of the Spirit to continue boldly speaking the Word of God and bearing fruit on mission. May I suggest that you and I also need to be filled and empowered afresh by the Holy Spirit? May I suggest that we cannot rely on yesterday's manna? In John chapter 6, verse 50, Jesus said that he himself is the bread that came down from heaven. He is our daily bread, Christ in us, the hope of glory. And so we need to receive his presence through the Spirit each day if we are going to stay the course as a mission-focused people, multiplying disciples everywhere, especially as we go to those places where few or none have access to Jesus. Friends, we have been entrusted with an extraordinarily challenging mission as the Alliance in Canada. It's the same calling as the Apostle Paul articulated in Romans 15 verse 20, when he said, It has always been my ambition to preach the gospel where Christ was not known, so that I would not be building on someone else's foundation. Now, preaching the gospel anywhere can be challenging. But the particular calling to take the gospel where Christ is not yet known to those people groups who have had little or no access to Jesus ever, it's far beyond our human or organizational capacity. We can have all the good intentions in the world, just like the disciples when they vowed to never abandon Jesus. But that won't be enough to sustain, let alone accelerate, our mission to the least reached peoples of the world. It's only through a continual posture of being with Jesus in prayer and worship, abiding in Christ and crying out to him to empower us through his spirit that we can do the work he has given us. All of this leads us to the final part of our vision prayer. We ask God to transform us into mission-focused people, multiplying disciples everywhere. Uh, later in the book of Acts, after many of Paul's missionary journeys, we read the extraordinary account of him setting out for Jerusalem. Now, amazingly, he has gone to those who did not yet know Christ. He has borne fruit among the least reached, uh, and he has um, reached them through spirit-empowered mission. And now he's bringing back an offering from these new churches to help the poor and needy in Jerusalem. And so his mission comes full circle. The very people he reached are now the ones helping those who sent him. Doesn't that sound a lot like the CCACA in Canada? Praise the Lord for all of you, our dear Chinese churches, and those from many other nations as well. Those of you who are coming from other countries and are now preaching the gospel to us. You're the ones who are leading the way in the Alliance of Canada to keep us focused on mission. Your giving is extraordinary. Your commitment to send out workers is second to none. And on top of that, your tenacity in continuing to stoke the fires of mission in your churches through things like this joint mission conference show that you want to do even more to boldly advance the kingdom of God. I praise God because of you. Well, this is like what happened through Paul's mission. He has reached these people and now they're coming back to serve the poor in Jerusalem. 
Well, Paul describes his sense of calling to return to Jerusalem in this way in Acts chapter 20, verses 22 to 24. He says, And now, compelled by the Spirit, I am going to Jerusalem, not knowing what will happen to me there. I only know that in every city the Holy Spirit warns me that prison and hardships are facing me. However, I consider my life worth nothing to me. My only aim is to finish the race and complete the task the Lord Jesus has given me. The task of testifying to the good news of God's grace. Isn't that an extraordinary picture of a mission-focused life? My only aim is to complete the task the Lord Jesus has given me. So how did he do it? How did Paul stay so mission-focused in spite of all the suffering he faced? Well, I'd like to suggest that it was his intimacy with Christ in prayer and worship. Notice in verse 23 that, that Paul had been listening to the Holy Spirit, receiving his warnings that prison and hardships awaited him. And what's amazing to me is that Paul still obeyed despite those warnings. Perhaps, if we're honest, sometimes the reason we don't hear the Spirit in our own lives is because we don't actually want to obey what he says. Well, as we move into Acts chapter 21, we see how the story continues to unfold with more warnings about the trouble Paul would face. In verses 10 to 13, it says, a prophet named Agabus came down from Judea. Coming over to us, he took Paul's belt, tied his own hands and feet with it, and said, The Holy Spirit says, In this way, the Jewish leaders in Jerusalem will bind the owner of this belt and will hand him over to the Gentiles. Well, when we heard this, we and the people there pleaded with Paul not to go up to Jerusalem. Then Paul answered, Why are you weeping and breaking my heart? I am ready not only to be bound, but also to die in Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. Talk about a mission-focused person. And I would add a Christ-centered, spirit-empowered one as well. You see, Paul had been with Jesus. In fact, in Acts 22, verses 17 to 21, Paul recounts how in his time of prayer, the Lord had spoken to him and commissioned him to go far away to the Gentiles. Likewise, he recounts in Acts 20, verse 22, like we already read, that the reason he was going back to Jerusalem was because he was compelled by the Spirit. So we see that it was through his intimacy with Jesus in prayer, his sensitivity to the Spirit, and I would add his confidence in the Spirit's empowerment that Paul became so mission-focused, even to the point of being willing to follow the Spirit into prophesied hardship. How about you? Have you put any limits on how mission-focused you are willing to be? How much you're willing to do to provide access to Jesus where few or none have heard? How much you're willing to pray? How much you're willing to give? How far you're willing to go? If so, may I suggest that the only way you'll ever push through those barriers is by saturating yourself in the presence of Jesus through prayer and worship. Only intimacy will sustain that kind of mission. You see, friends, this is not about trying harder or sacrificing more, though that may be required. This is first and foremost about enjoying Jesus and abiding in Him, truly centering our lives in His presence. Paul said in 2 Corinthians 5 verse 14 that it was the love of Christ that compelled him. It wasn't primarily about duty. It was about love. He had been with Jesus. He had heard Him reveal to him the Master's business, the things and people who were on the Father's heart. And so he went. He did the unthinkable. He abided with Jesus. And so, as it says in John 15, like we saw earlier, the joy of Jesus, Jesus was in him, and his joy was complete. So much so that he had to share it with those who had little or no access to it. Not only that, 
but he also received power from on high when the Holy Spirit came upon him. And so he was a witness for Jesus, along with all the other disciples in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Amen. May the same be true of us. Hi, church. Hi there. How are you? Long time no see. It's been a while since we talked to you. We thought maybe we'd get, get you caught up on what we've been up to the last little while. We've been doing something called MG Forum. It uh, was an opportunity for us to help prepare a multi-generational uh, cross-cultural um, conference for youth workers with Um Baptist, which is the Baptist Youth Network, and also Lage, which is InterVarsity here in Norway. And we also uh, were worship speakers for that uh, opportunity. And also something different. Ivy was a panelist for a children's ministry uh, to a network in uh, East Norway, and uh, she's going to tell you a little bit about that opportunity. For this particular ministry, we, the panelists, help to answer difficult questions to all the youth and children workers, such as, where did the dinosaurs go? How come God gave us rainbows? Or, uh, is homosexual okay? Hmm. Recently, we also had a connection with uh, all the youth downstairs in our building. And we had a, a, a planning meeting here in our uh, apartment with the Jesus Revolution, which is um, uh, youth in the gap year that are willing to uh, spend time doing missionary work and training um, as an opportunity in that time. And uh, in that meeting, we also uh, arranged to have a joint uh, Sunday service with them. And that uh, turned out to be really an awesome experience. Ooh. And we also seized the opportunity for this beautiful weather that Glenn served as a barbecue chef and fed 22 hungry youths living in the same apartment building with us. Talk about love our neighbors. Also, with our newly acquired uh, uh, puppy, uh, Cassie, in uh, October last year, she's really been an useful uh, in as an ambassador for uh, our church here. Um, when taking her for walks in the park, I've had people stopping me and asking me about her, and I uh, had an opportunity to tell them about uh, the church work that we're doing here in, in uh, Norway, and uh, it's an opportunity to speak to our neighbors as well. And here's our prayer request. Please pray for our summer camp. Yes, and we have two summer camps this year. An online summer camp for the Chinese uh, congregation with about 350 participants. We are uh, in charge of three workshops and panel discussions. And secondly, we have a physical English camp at a place called Hama, which is a, a month, an hour and a half from here. And we'll have 50 participants there and aiming to spread the good news to the, the non-Christians, uh, friends that they bring. Here's another prayer request. We also have two ongoing baptismal classes to prepare newcomers for, to receive the baptism at Christmas this year. And that's really exciting for us. Here are our prayer requests and our latest updates. Thank you for loving us and supporting us all this time. And we love you and be praying for you. We'll continue going on this. Now let us continue with our time of worship by singing the song of response. Jesus. 
Jesus is calling Have you come to the end of yourself? Do you thirst for a drink from the well? Jesus is calling Oh, come to the altar The Father's sums are open one Forgiveness was bought with The precious blood of Jesus Christ Sing leave behind behind your regrets and mistakes come today there's no reason to wait Jesus is calling bring your sorrows and trade them for joy from the ashes a new life is born Jesus is calling Now is the time of tithe and offering. Tithe and offering is a Christian's privilege to respond to Jesus' love and God's provision through tithe and offering. If you don't understand the meaning of tithe and offering, you don't have to give. If you want to give, you can give to donate at ncac.ca or send checks to our church address, 1490 Birchbound Road.
Let us bow down and pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you that um, uh, we have this privilege and honor to offer monetary gift as, a, as, as, as our response to your love. And we ask that God, you will continue to uh, use us and our gift uh, to further your kingdom so that your name will be glorified and will spread out all over the world. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. July is our church NCAC's mission month. Please continue to support our mission work through prayer and through money offering. And also, after our Sunday service at 11 o'clock, we will have our Sunday school. And today's topic is Apostles Creed. We will have our prayer meeting for our international worker on July 21st at 8 o'clock. Please join and come to listen to their sharing and pray with, and pray with them. Thank you everyone for joining our service. Morning NCAC. This Wednesday at 8 p.m. we have Kevin and Carol Lim joining us from Cambodia at our corporate prayer night. So please join us for a time of praying and sharing and uh, we'll see you all there. The details of the meeting can be found in Pastor Vince's weekly email. Thank you. Good morning NCAC. John here on behalf of the Children's Ministry and we want to thank you everybody for your continued support and prayers of, uh, for, for Children's Ministry. Uh, the past year and a bit of online has been amazing and um, and yeah we, could, we wouldn't be able to do it without your help uh, so thank you for that. Um, for Children's Online Worship we're actually going to be taking a break for the next uh, few weeks. Uh, we just wrapped up last week and, um, and we're going to be taking a break for the summer uh, so that we can plan rest and recharge for September. So we're definitely looking forward to serving uh, the children at CAC in that um, once again. Uh, as for what's going on now, well, VBS started this week and um, it's online once again. And we have an, an amazing group of, of leaders and volunteers uh, working alongside me. And uh, we're hoping to make this, uh, this VBS the best online one ever. Um, Thank you again to everybody who supported this ministry, uh, to the Children's Ministry team, uh, who's done all the interviews and all the arranging, and uh, and also for all the uh, all those on the Chinese side who have um, graciously offered to to cook for the for the team for the three weeks that we're running camp. Uh, just a couple prayer items that that we have. Um, pray for continued energy and and creativity uh, for the workers, as uh, online is online's a it's a it's a different game uh, than, than being in person. And uh, so just pray for inspiration and creativity for, for all of them. And pray for the relationships with the, with the kids, that we can build a relationship with them uh, through virtual, uh, that they'll be engaged, that they'll want to come back uh, for the three weeks that, uh, that we're hosting the camp, and that we can really, really reach and touch their lives. Uh, also pray for our two gospel speakers who will, who will be coming in next uh, this week by the time you see it. Um, you know, pray that they um, that God can work through them to to convey the gospel message and and um, and that hopefully that uh, that there'll be some some kids that who will want to accept Christ into their lives. So thank you so much again. Um, we appreciate it, and we'll give you an update next week. Now let us sing doxology. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, we thank you once again for joining us in this Mission Emphasis Month. We live in a world where things are changing rapidly. New challenges and new threats arise each and every moment. As we heard today from Reverend Curtis Peters, a deep level of encounter is needed. We heard about the importance of worship and prayer. We thank God for 
Reverend Curtis Peters, who brought God's word to us today. As we walk forward in our mission's work, let's move with the mindset of worship. Let's move with the mindset of seeking God and His presence. Let's pray and ask God to send us with His blessing that we will be instrument of God's blessings to the people that we meet. Father, we thank you, Lord, that we know you as Lord and Savior of our life. We thank you, Lord, that, that the joy that we experience each and every moment. And we thank you, Lord, Lord, for the forgiveness of sins and the hope that comes in knowing you. We pray, God, that as we live a life for you, help us, Lord, to live a life in worship and prayer. We pray for many, your God, who have not experienced your love. We pray that, that you'll use us, Father. Send us, O God, with your blessing. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, the presence, the power of the Holy Spirit, be with us to bless us, be with us to guard us, be with us until we see Jesus face to face and God's people say, Amen. The Lord be with you.